Give me words of wisdom and uh, give us all heart change and life change in what we learn uh, from uh, this story this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 7, verse 53 through 8, 11. Then the meeting broke up and everyone went home. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. So we know that Jesus is in Jerusalem. A crowd soon gathered and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and Pharisees brought a woman they had caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her, what do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him, but Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, All right, stone her, but let those who have never sinned throw the first stones. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with this woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to her, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Now, we have to start uh, at at an awkward place with this text, and that is, in your Bibles, uh, it's going to say at the beginning, the most ancient Greek manuscripts do not include John 7, 53 through 8, 11. And so uh, we have to address that for a minute, and I'm not going to say a whole lot. We could spend a whole morning just talking about why that's the case, and I could go in and help you understand exactly how they put the manuscript together and why it was and wasn't included. Just give me two minutes on this, and and then we're going to move on, okay? Uh, But but let me just say this. Um, One of the most ancient manuscripts has it in there. Others do not. So the first question that scholars ask is, did the event really occur? Regardless of whether it was recorded or not, did it really occur? And, and most scholars will say the story is consistent with how Jesus performed his ministry and how he dealt with people. And so there's no inconsistency at all in the story with the nature of Jesus and his ministry. And so most everyone feels very comfortable that the story actually occurred, that this wasn't some made-up story that someone later on stuck in the Gospel of John and got it through, okay? So second, the question comes, so then why is it missing from some of the earliest manuscripts? And you have to understand that the earliest manuscripts we have are from about the 3rd century. So just about the length of time that our nation has been a nation is the length of time that went by before we have the earliest manuscripts we've discovered. Okay, so we've discovered things that are almost all the way back to the New Testament church, but not quite. So we have a couple of hundred years of, of play here. Why would it, why would it be, not be in these manuscripts that are 200 years later? There's a lot of scholars that weigh in on this. I'm going to give you my personal opinion, which, by the way, is worth nothing. But I'm going to give you my personal opinion. Here's what I think. I think the story actually occurred, and I think John actually fit the story in his gospel. I think the early church struggled with sex the same way the, co- the current church struggles with sex. They didn't know what to do with it. They don't know what to do with sex and sexual sin, and that seems to be a special sin, and that seems to be something that we have a harder time addressing than, than other sins. And I think this story gave the early church indigestion. Because it seems that Jesus was a little light on sin and a little light on sexual sin. And this story almost gives permission. And so somewhere along the way, in the first couple of hundred years of the church, the church says, you know, we don't really know what to do with this story because Jesus is just, there's just too much grace here. We've got to take this story out to protect our people from license to sin. And so they took the story out. But... As you know, the Holy Spirit is bigger and more powerful than any group of people that make a decision about whether a story should be in there. So, not everyone took it out, not every manuscript took it out, and the Holy Spirit made sure that it survived that period of time and ended up in the manuscripts so that, in our current Bibles, it is a part of the Bible. 
Does that make sense? Okay, so here's, here's what I want to do, because this is our, our last time to stop before the end of the story here in about 30 minutes. I just want you to stop, and I want you to take two or three minutes, just two or three, and I want you to ask, answer this question. How does the contemporary church address sexual sin in the lives of its members? Now, I know that could be a 30-minute discussion. Two minutes. In your experience, okay, this isn't a Bible question, just in your experience in being a part of organized church, how does organized church handle sexual sin with its members? Ready? <laughs> Go. Uh, what, what I have given you here today uh, are, are my sermon notes. When I went back to rewrite this as a Bible study, I just got stuck. I, I, didn't, know, I didn't know how to do that. And so uh, I've included a, a bunch of stuff in here that I normally don't include in, in uh, the Bible study notes. So if, if you ever get asked to preach on this, just pull this out and you, you got you a sermon you can preach. Okay? So, so let's just kind of run through here. I, I begin with what I call the accusation in 8, 1 through 5, where they bring this woman up uh, before Jesus, who is uh, caught in the act of adultery. Now, you know that Jesus came to Jerusalem to teach. Okay? He teaches with authority. The people love his teaching. The religious leaders do not like his teaching. They are intimidated by him. They are uh, upset with the fact that so many people are turning to Jesus and listening to him, and they were losing some of their power and some of their authority. We know all that. We've talked about that a lot in this gospel. Uh, and so what happens here is, is, is they would pose hard questions to Jesus to try to trap him. And we saw it over and over and over again. Anytime you read the gospels, you'll see that. And they never were able to trap him, but it wasn't for a lack of trying. <laughs> and so understand that, that from the Pharisees' point of view, this story has nothing to do with a woman or sexual sin. This story has one purpose and one purpose only. They're trying to trap Jesus into saying or doing something that they can use against him. Okay, And we'll show you how the trap lays out here in just a moment. But Mosaic Law, Leviticus 20.10 says, If a man commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, both the man and the woman who committed adultery must be put to death. So there's the law. There's the Old Testament law that they're going to refer to. Moses said that she needs to be stoned. Okay, But when you look at the law during Jesus' time in Jerusalem, uh, you will find that the law was rarely abided by. And here's the reason. If you'll, if you'll look down at the bottom of that first page. By the first century... This law was not commonly upheld in Jewish culture. The Jewish legal system required two witnesses to bring the accusation. Okay, so if, if you're actually accused and, and condemned, you're going to get stoned for, for committing adultery, for having sex in that culture outside of marriage. Okay, but here's what it took according to their law in order for that to happen. And when I say their law, I'm not talking about the Bible I'm talking about the laws that the Jews, Jewish leaders, put around the Bible. Okay, so here it is. Leon Morris writes this. It was required that there be two witnesses, and it was not enough for the witnesses to have seen the offenders in a compromising position, such as coming out of a room in which they had been alone. Even lying on a bed together was not sufficient proof. The witnesses must be able to testify that the movements of the people in question allowed no other interpretation. And, of course, the evidence of the two witnesses must agree. <laughs> Does that explain it well enough? Do I need to go into any more detail than that? Okay. So, for there to be an accusation, there had to be two people witness the actual act where there's no other plausible explanation. Only then could they bring it to court with an accusation. So for them to bring this woman in and say she was caught in the very act of adultery, what are they claiming? They actually saw her in that act. Okay? Well, good question. Next page <laughs> answers the question. So 
so first of all, it was very hard to bring the accusation. And of course, the, the obvious next question is exactly what you said, where is the man? The system was a corrupt system, and it was built around uh, making sure that men never got caught in the act of adultery. The, the whole system, you, you understand that whole culture was a male-dominated culture. We don't understand that today. But, but it was the whole system, all the laws were set up to protect the man with little regard for the woman. Okay, So here's what would happen. A woman was stoned if she was caught in any sexual sin. But, but the Pharisees had changed the law of God and said, a man was only stoned if he was married and his partner was married. So in other words, if a man was married and he was with an unmarried woman, they overlooked it. If a man was not married and he was with a married woman, they would overlook it. The only way a man would be stoned is if he's married and the partner is married. But a woman was stoned no matter what. Second, second, you had to be caught in the act, and they were not prone to throw each other under the bus because, from what I read, tradition says sexual sin was pretty widespread among the upper echelon in that culture. And so what they would do is there was a huge stigma on divorce in that culture. And so what men would do to protect their inheritance, their money, and also to protect the stigma of divorce, is if they wanted to get rid of their wives, they would have a friend go seduce her and sleep with her. They would get caught in the act of adultery. The woman would be brought forth and stoned, and the man would magically get away. And so the whole system was around, set up for men getting away with it and women paying the price. It was just abhorrent what went on. And, and it, it baffles me today to hear the ignorance of people when people in our culture talk about Jesus was sexist or, or Jesus was a male chauvinist. Are you kidding me? You, you're talking about a man that fought for the rights of women. He is in a male-dominated culture where women were nothing more than property to be bought and sold. You, you realize, as a woman in that culture, if a man came to have sex with me, I really couldn't resist. I mean, they would, they would have their way with a woman, and the woman really had, had nothing she could do about it. She had no legal recourse. And that's the kind of culture they lived in. And, and, and Jesus always stood up for women. He valued women greatly. You get that picture? So, now Jesus is teaching along one day. I mean, just, just minding his own business, teaching the people. And here they come, dragging in this woman, saying, guess what? All the conditions of our law were met. There's two of us that physically saw her in the act of adultery with a man. Oh, and by the way, he got away. We, we don't know how, but boy, he just he ran out and he's gone. But we got her. And you know what the law says? The law says we've got to stone her. Jesus, question, what do you have to say about this matter? Now, here's what they believe. Here's what they're trying to do to Jesus. They're trying to trap him, right? So think through the consequences. If Jesus comes along and says, well, yes, we need to stone her, well, they've got him. Because one, that goes against everything Jesus taught in his ministry. He had a ministry of compassion. It was a ministry about the poor, about the underprivileged. He was a protector of women. They knew that. And so it goes against his basic message of his ministry. But second, in, in the, once Rome took over, no Jewish person, the, the Jewish council could not put anyone to death. They had to get permission from Rome. So they really couldn't enforce the law. But if they could get Jesus to say, yes, she needs to be stoned, then they could take that. Now, I know this is surprising that any sort of organization would do that, but they could take it out of context and go to Rome and say, this guy's wanting to, to kill someone. He's, he's wanting to practice capital punishment himself without the authority of Rome and get Jesus in trouble with Rome. See how they were thinking on that direction? So they're going, oh, we got him there, but we also got him on the other side. Because if Jesus comes and says, oh, don't stone her, what has he just done? Undermine the law. So these guys, in their wisdom, 
say, we got Jesus trapped one way or the other. We finally got him. We can either uh, ruin his reputation because he won't uphold the law, or we're going to ruin his reputation because he does uphold the law. Either way, we got him. And so they bring the accusation, they bring the woman in, they set the trap, and they say, now Jesus, what are you going to do? Understand this. Those men didn't care about the law or this woman. They only cared about doing away with Jesus. And so what Jesus does next is one of the most famous things in the gospel. He doesn't answer their question. How many times do they ask a question Jesus doesn't answer? (laughs) Over and over and over again. Have you ever noticed that Jesus, when he was dealing with the Pharisees, what would he always do? He would turn around and answer their question with a question that usually trapped them, right? Well, here's what he does this time. He doesn't answer their question. Instead, he bends down and writes in the dirt. Now, it's interesting to me. It says here, they kept demanding an answer. They kept demanding an answer. What does that mean? They kept after him and kept after him and kept after him. They wouldn't leave him alone because they really thought they had him this time. And so they were pressing him and pressing him and pressing him. And so he writes in the sand and then he stands up and says, Okay, stoner, but who, you who has no sin, cast the first stone. And they all, from the, from the oldest to the youngest, it says, from the wisest to the most foolish, <laughs> drop their stones and walk away. Now, the big question that everyone wants to know is, what does he write in the dirt? Here's what you have to know. No one knows. If you ever hear a preacher tell what he wrote in the dirt, that preacher has no idea. Okay? Now, there's a whole lot of conjecture. Some, some scholars say, well, maybe he was writing their sins on the ground. And that's why he said, you without sin, throw the first stone. That's a very good possibility. Another one could be, maybe he, maybe he was writing a verse of Scripture in the ground that they would be aware of. Um, that's a possibility. Uh, we, don't know, we don't know what he was, was writing. Maybe he's playing tic-tac-toe. We don't know. But I am going to give you a possibility that I find is interesting, and this is in your notes, and I just want to read this for you because I think it's kind of fascinating. There's a well-known apocryphal book during that time that everyone would have known. And when I'm, I'm not talking about the common people. I'm talking about the educated people, the Pharisees and Jesus. And it was called the Book of Susanna. This book addressed the hypocrisy and corruption surrounding the adultery laws in Jewish culture. So in other words, everyone knew it was corrupt, and, and there was this expose, there was this parable written about it to just expose the corruption. And here's how it worked. There were two wicked elders who tried to persuade this young girl, Susanna, to have sex with them. When she refused, they accused her of having sex with a young man and took her to court. Because you have to have what? Two accusers. She was condemned to die, but as she was being led to her execution, the young man, Daniel, who's the hero in the story, who it was accused she had sex with, convinced the judge to take the two religious leaders back to the place of the crime. There, he examined the witnesses separately, exposing their deceit. Susanna was spared, and the two men died for their wicked scheme. At the end of that story... Exodus 23, 7 was quoted. Be sure never to charge anyone falsely with evil, for I never declare a guilty person to be innocent. And so some scholars just wonder if maybe he wrote the word Susanna in the, in the ground that day that would remind them of they are doing the very thing that these guys were doing in that story. So there's you another possibility to add to your possibility of what might have happened there. We don't know. But whatever it was, it was so profound that one by one, oldest to youngest, the guys just dropped their stones and walked away. The trap had been set, but it did not work because, as usual, Jesus turned it back around on them. So the conclusion, then, is 10 and 11. She was left alone with Jesus. The crowd was still around, but she's left alone with Jesus. The Pharisees, her accusers are gone. And Jesus says this, where are your accusers? Did they not condemn you? And she says, no, Lord, they didn't condemn me. And then he says, 
then neither do I. Now go and sin no more. Now the irony is, he says you without sin throw the first stone. The only person in the room who had no sin was him. He was the only one who had the right to throw the stone. And he was the one that chose not to. And so, of course, this is a story about grace. And then he says to her, now, now, go and sin no more. Uh, Some versions, the Greek more accurately says, leave your life of sin. Walk away from your sinful life. In other words, what? Follow me. Follow me. Something tells me she probably did. Something tells me she probably did. So here's what we're going to do with the rest of our time together this morning. I tried to tell the story as quickly as I could to give us more time around the table. So what I want to do, and you guys know the drill here, because you've been with me long enough, when you study the Gospels and you're reading a story, what the Gospels demand you to do is ask the question, who do I most relate to in the story? And there's three characters in this story. There's the woman, there's the Pharisees, and there's Jesus. And so we're going to spend three different points in time around our tables talking about this story from the viewpoint of that person. So the first one is the woman. What do we learn about us from this woman? And that is that Christ gives mercy and not condemnation because reality is we are that woman. This story is the story of our lives. We have sin and we deserve to be condemned. We deserve to be stoned. We deserve to go to hell. Do you get that? Do you understand that without the blood of Jesus Christ, without the grace and mercy of God himself, that the the, the perfect, obvious response to your life is that you should die and spend eternity apart from God? And yet, because of the unbelievable actions of Christ, i.e. the cross, we now have forgiveness and we now have healing We now have grace. So here's where I want us to go next this morning. See that question right there? What is your reaction to the amazing grace found in Jesus? How has God's grace impacted your life? Can we just start there? Can we spend about five or six minutes around the tables and just ask that question and answer it? What does the grace of God mean for you? How has the grace of God changed your life? Stay there and then we'll come back and talk about the Pharisees and and go with it from a little different angle. It's so interesting to me. I've uh, I've been in ministry since 1986. It's a long time, 32 years. And what I've found over 32 years is I've been surprised at how many people uh, refuse to accept grace. Uh, their, their minds are so wrapped around the concept of I've got to earn my way that when you explain to them the simple message of here's what you deserve, but God loved you so much he's willing to do this. I, I can't tell you how many people who, who have just, they're just, they're mentally they're just almost not capable of accepting the fact that they could get salvation for nothing um and and i'm sure you've heard the same excuses i don't deserve this Uh, i've done too much my sin is too unique um and and it's it's such a heartbreak to me because really when we refuse to accept his grace and his forgiveness when we refuse to forgive ourselves you know what we're usually saying well, your blood's not enough, Jesus. It's not enough for my sin. And, and what do we know? It is enough. It is enough. Grace is the most beautiful, simple, incredible gift any human being could ever receive. But it's amazing how hard it is to accept. Because somehow we want to make a transaction out of it so we feel like we've contributed something. And you understand that there's nothing transactional about a relationship with Jesus Christ. The transaction was made on the cross. The transaction's over. So there's no transaction because you have nothing to bring to it. It's a gift. It's not a transaction. You understand the difference? And so I don't, I don't engage in a transaction. I just accept a gift. For prideful, egocentric men... 
That is really difficult to do, <laughs> right? So grace is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Number two, we, we need to look at the story from the eyes of the religious leaders. The religious leaders, of course, today represent the church. And the story tells us something about how we're supposed to handle sexual sin in the church. And the answer is not that we ignore it. And the answer is not that we condemn it. The answer is that we practice restoration. Isn't that what Jesus did? The problem with the Pharisees is, is, is they didn't care about people. But everything in my Bible I read says the whole, the whole story of the gospel is about people. And it's interesting to me in Matthew chapter 7, he, Jesus says, Stop judging others and you will not be judged. These people were judging her, correct? And so according to my Bible, if I understand it right, they're going to be judged the same way they judged her, by God himself. There's not a lot of grace in their judgment, was there? Whatever measure you use in judging others, it will be used to measure how you are judged. So the more judgmental I am toward others, the more judgmental God will be toward me. That scares me just a little bit. Here's what I've learned. If you're going to err, it's always better to err on the side of mercy than judgment. Right? Now that doesn't mean that we don't confront sin. In fact, listen to what he says next. Why worry about picking a speck out of your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying, let me help you get rid of your speck when you can't see past the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. Now listen to what he says. First get rid of the log from your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. In other words, I'm not supposed to ignore his sin. What am I supposed to do? Deal with me first so my heart is pure, then I'm in a place that I can come help my friend. For what purpose? To bring him back and have him reconcile to God, right? So I'm, I'm, the, the, the position of Jesus and the position of the church is not ignore sin or condemn sin, sinners, I'm sorry, but it's to what? Hate the sin and love the sinner. Restore the person back to God. Just take people and introduce them to grace. And God and the Holy Spirit will do the rest. I don't have anything else to do in that process. I don't have to judge. I don't have to be the jury. I don't have to decide what's worthy and not, what's not worthy. I'm just taking people to the throne room of grace. There's this phrase that I love that I heard a long time ago in a Christian concert when, when this guy who was leading worship, uh, had, had he was homosexual and the Lord healed him of that. He, he rescued him of that. And he was, he was married and had nine kids at the time. I think he was proving himself non-homosexual. <laughs> and, and he said, let me tell you who I am. I'm just a trophy of his grace. And that's what we all are. If you're a believer today, all you are is a trophy of his grace. You're just a walking, living testimony of, look what God can do with a, with a lump of coal. <laughs> he can do this. We're just a trophy of his grace. And that's what the church is supposed to be. So our second time around the, the, the tables here, uh, here's a couple of questions. Uh, how do we balance standing for truth in Scripture with the obvious call to bring restoration to people in need? What does it mean that we are trophies of his grace? So talk a little bit about that tension between standing up for truth and not ignoring sin and yet the duty to restore people. We'll talk about that for about three or four minutes and then we'll come back and wrap up. Okay, third, we have to look at this story from the standpoint of Jesus. And I, th I think the, maybe the most powerful part of the story is after everyone is gone, it's just Jesus and this woman, and he says, neither do I continue, condemn you, go and sin no more. And, and there's a phrase here I put on your notes that, that I think is really, really uh, important for us to understand, and that is this. The natural response to mercy for our past is obedience in our future, right? Jesus didn't overlook the sin. In fact, it's interesting to me. He doesn't claim she didn't do the sin, does he? He just said, neither do I condemn you. I forgive you. Here is my grace. But what does that mean? Go and leave your life of sin. Come follow me. Let me recreate you. 
You are a new person. That is the old you. You don't stay in your old life of sin. And we have something, in, in, unfortunately now, we have a, a concept called cheap grace. <laughs> and that is where you're not condemned for your sin, but you don't leave your life of sin. You just continue in it. And, of course, we all know that's false grace. That's not grace at all. Because when I am I'm saved by the grace of God and have experienced His grace, the natural response is, is to, to leave my life of sin and allow Him to change me into His image. And so we're going to wrap up today. You've got just a few minutes here left. I, I want you to wrap up by just talking a little bit about how does grace empower us for obedience? Because it's obvious that we're not empowered for obedience out of our own willingness to be good. That doesn't work. But somehow grace empowers us to be obedient. And so talk about that and talk about your takeaways from the day. Uh, And then you guys, uh, the week is yours, and I hope you guys have a great week.